1534, Ignatius of La Jolla, along with Francis Xavier and Peter Faber, founded the Society of Jesus, they envisioned a religious order that would spread the Catholic faith to all of the world, not just through the preaching of the gospel, but through the education of the faithful in the dictates of the Roman Confession of Christianity. This order, which would grow from the sons of nobility and the educated classes, would take the lead in establishing centers of religious education throughout a religiously fracturing Europe, and take the lead in promoting the principles of the Council of Trent and the Counter-Reformation that followed it. As a result of the highly educated nature of the order, there arose within it a group of astronomers who sought to understand the heavens as an expression of God's work, but also as something worth understanding in order to better establish the Christian calendar in a time when things seemed to be slowly slipping out of order. Beginning with efforts at calendar reform that eventually led to the establishment of the Gregorian calendar, the Jesuits would continue their work in astronomy, and in doing so would become the first, at least among the first, to independently confirm Galileo's telescopic observations. They would also observe sunspots on the moon and discover a number of new objects in the heavens. As such, they would also become deeply embroiled in the controversy that surrounded Galileo and the evaluation of heliocentric models of the solar system. In their engagement with this debate, both during its taking place and afterwards, they would carry astronomy all over the world and clearly establish the arguments against that model's adoption. In this episode of the Odyssey, we'll look at the work of those Jesuit astronomers and the effects it had. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 26.1, Supplemental. Jesuit Astronomers and the Difficulty of doing science. In this episode, what I'd like to do is spend a bit more time talking about a few more figures that have gotten the short end of the stick, so to speak, before moving on to a more detailed discussion of the work of Giovanni Battista Riccoli, and then sharing a few thoughts on just how tricky a thing doing science can be by considering Riccioli's work both in the framework of his time and in the judgment of history. I think that before we jump into Newton's reimagining of the entire framework of Aristotelian physics and thus establishing the foundations of a new physics, at least the physics as we know it today, it's useful to look at the period immediately prior to him to understand just how revolutionary what he did was. The first person I think we really need to talk about a little more is Christopher Shiner. When looking at the story of the Galileo affair, Shiner has this sort of tendency to become, acro- to become or come across as kind of a bad guy, especially in the second phase of that extended debate when it seems like he's probably that individual that pours gasoline on the fire by making sure that the Pope sees the additional document in Galileo's file. As a result of the nature of the Galileo narrative, Shiner's work as a Jesuit astronomer really gets overshadowed, something that's pretty unfortunate. While Shiner was not the first person to observe sunspots, nor was he the one who developed the first methods to make good, detailed observations of their shapes and motions, he is, without question, the person responsible for refining those techniques to a very high level of precision and then using them to compile a wealth of observational evidence that both confirmed and extended Galileo's initial conclusions. I don't think that it's a stretch to say that what Brahe did for planetary observations, Shiner did for solar observation. He was, in many ways, the first truly solar astronomer, and his work would be vital for the next several centuries in that subdiscipline. 
beyond observing the motion of the sunspots across the disk of the sun. Shiner also establishes their structure and how that structure changed over time. From this, he was able to make a strong case that at least part of the phenomenon involved some sort of a solar atmosphere, and he was also the first person to actually observe solar prominences at the limb or the edge of the sun. All of this was accomplished through the refinement of the solar projection or the telescopic solar projection technique that he had set on an extremely stable and accurate mount, what we call the equatorial mount. This type of mount for a telescope was first developed or at least first suggested by somebody like Kepler, but Shiner's the first person to actually develop it on a working instrument and then use it to make observations. And so it allowed him to cast images through his sort of a telescopic uh, methodology some 20 feet onto his uh, piece of paper that allowed him to make very, very detailed observations and studies. With 10 years of observations by the time of 1623 and almost 20 years by 1632, one can understand why Shiner would have been very sensitive to Galileo's criticisms of his conclusions that were published in a work known as Rosa Ursina Sive Sol. And it seems to be that work that Galileo more or less kind of plagiarizes some of his discussion on sunspots in his 19 or his 1632 publication of the dialogue. It's really unfortunate that Galileo just can't seem to get past his um, his conflict with Shiner, and the two of them could have really done some really interesting work together. Unfortunately, that's not how that played out, and so we get this narrative with uh, with Galileo and with Shiner afterwards that's just very adversarial, which is just tremendously unfortunate, and it really overshadows Shiner's excellent works. The next thing I'd like to talk about is, I think, one of the most interesting and influential chapters in Jesuit science, and it's centered around that organization's work to take Christianity to China. While it's beyond the scope of this episode to go into a great deal as to the methods the Brothers of the Society of Jesus used to accomplish that goal, it should be noted that contrary to many other episodes of religious missionary outreach effort, the Jesuits worked very hard to treat tri- Chinese culture with dignity and respect. And the the first thing they tried to do whenever they entered a society, and specifically when they tried to enter Chinese society, was to work to meet the needs of the society in which they engaged. In the case of Chinese ruling class, this meant working to update and reform astronomical practice. By the 1600s, Chinese astronomy, while possessing an amazingly vast treasure trove of observational data and empirically based rules and guidelines to predict events, lacked any sort of truly organizing framework in which to understand all of that information. While Chinese astronomers had measured the length of the year to very high levels of accuracy, they had found it difficult to systematize that astronomical system in such a way that it took into account the fractional numbers of days in a year. In other words, the calendar was still based on a process of observation rather than one of calculation, as was the case by this time in Europe. So to understand this a little better, it's useful to think of an instance when knowing when an event would occur would have been thought to be really useful, in this case, predicting the exact time of a solar eclipse. As it had been known for at least a couple thousand years in China, eclipses happen on a regularly repeating pattern. However, due to the way the days kind of move around a bit, due to the fact that the the year is actually 365.2411 days long, it was hard to predict the exact time any given eclipse would occur if you just wanted to do it based off sort of empirically looking at past instances of solar eclipse in some sort of a pattern. The reason being able to do this was desirable is because the Chinese thought that solar eclipses were caused, at least in terms of folklore, by a giant dragon trying to either eat the sun, which is most commonly the thing that you heard about, or sometimes it was thought they were trying, the dragon was trying to eat the moon as passed in front of the sun. And so to foil this attempt, people would set off a lot of loud fireworks with the intention of scaring that dragon away. In order to do this, though, you had to be able to predict both the day and the time an eclipse would occur, something that was problematic using the Chinese sort of empirical looking at past events system. So the way that worked was that 
the Chinese astronomers had to comb through their enormous volume of records and approximate when they thought the event would take place based on those past occurrences. And this approach, while certainly sufficient to get one into the ballpark of the or time frame for when the event would take place, was really just too unreliable, especially as the Chinese emperor, or the Shangdi by this time, was thought to be a divine being directly connected to the heavens. And what kind of divine being directly connected to the heavens can't actually, you know, know when things in the heavens are going to happen? What the Jesuits were able to do is bring the highly mathematical and theoretical European methodologies for calculating when such events would happen to the Chinese court and make much better predictions in their timing. This was put on display in 1644 when the Jesuits were not only able to predict the September 1st solar eclipse of that year to minute level accuracy as opposed to the 45 minute error made by the native Chinese calendars, but they were also able to take Shiner's projection methods and use them to display an image of the sun being eaten by the dragon on a sheet of paper. This success allowed them to bring in not only European models of the solar system, most notably the geoheliocentric system of Tycho, but also it allowed them to bring in Tycho's methods and standards of measurement and instrument instrumentation, something that the Chinese master craftsmen took to readily. Additionally, they were the first to take the telescope to China. One of the delightful ironies of the story is that after the advances were developed, you know, in telescopic measurement methods in Europe, the methods of Tycho and his large instruments fell by the wayside. However, in China, where Tycho's book was taken, translated, and copied to make high-precision naked-eye measurement experiments for the Imperial Observatory, the work was preserved in its most original form. And it's these copies that are now the best resources historians of science have for understanding how Tycho's instruments would have been constructed and used. As we mentioned in our last episode, probably the most influential figure during this period among the Jesuits was Giovanni Battista Riccioli. Riccioli in his new Almagest, more than anyone else, one else, seems to have tried to truly weigh the arguments for and against the heliocentric model of Copernicus. What should be noted here, however, is that Riccioli was not the first person to make the attempt to do that. In his arguments against Copernicus, a number of them are astronomical in nature, as we mentioned in that last episode. It turns out almost all of these arguments originated in the objections to Copernicus's work raised by Tycho Brahe. These arguments were then included in anti-Copernican works by people by the names of Johann George Locher and Francesco Ingoli. Locher was a student of Shiner's who published a work disputing Galileo's conclusions in 1614 that Galileo would respond to in great detail in the dialogue. In his work, Locher, while acknowledging the veracity of Galileo's telescopic discoveries, puts forth six arguments against heliocentrism. The first, and arguably most important of these, was religious in nature involving scriptural interpretation and the positions of heaven and hell. The remaining five follow the arguments of Tycho regarding things like star size, the vast emptiness of the cosmos, and the physical motion of dropped objects and projectiles that we mentioned in last week's episode. Ingoli follows this with his work put forth in 1616, likely at the request of Cardinal Bellarmine at the height of the debate in those two years 1615 to 1616 as a counter to Galileo's letter of 1613 and the other documents that were being circulated around at that time. Again, the bulk of the arguments Ingoli makes are scientific in nature, and he specifically asked Galileo to address these in some future publication, something Galileo did in a letter written in around 1624 at the bequest of his friends at the Lincean Academy soon after Pope Urban VIII indicated that he might be willing to re-examine the 1616 question. Unfortunately, Galileo's response never was published because, well, 
When he wrote it, it happened to be a really tense time during that period of the Thirty Years' War when you had various factions throughout Italy trying to figure out whose side the Pope was going to land on. And so Galileo decided to withhold publication and just circulate the letter in manuscript form. It was from these works that Riccioli's examination of the arguments for and against Copernicanism stem. Before we discuss that a bit further, I want to note that while this aspect of the new Almagest tends to get the most discussion, it should be understood that it only is some small part or some fraction of the larger work. The new Almagest was the book on astronomy following its publication in 1651. When John Flamsteed, the first British astronomer royal, in his role as Gresham Professor of Astronomy, gave public lectures on astronomy, it was the new Almagest that formed the basis for those lectures. The information and data found in the ten-part opus was the gold standard to which all astronomers compared their work and attempted to improve on. Riccioli's descriptions of the various observations, geometries, and motions of the heavens were more or less the gospel for several generations of astronomers following its publication, even as it was slowly superseded by the accumulating observations and theoretical constructs of both the members of Britain's fledgling Royal Society and Cassini's work at Paris Observatory as founded by King Louis XIV of France. If you were a young astronomer in 1670, such as Edmund Halley, the one book on astronomy you absolutely had to own was Riccioli's New Alchemist, and this is what made his discussion of the models of the solar system so incredibly important. So let's transition a bit and look at those arguments again for just a few more minutes. As a note here on my sources, the best book that takes a look at Riccioli's work is the recently published title by Christopher Graney, against all authority. While it's definitely a little bit of a scholarly take on the topic, I would strongly recommend it to anyone interested in digging into the period of astronomy between Galileo and Newton. It really is fantastically well researched and just extensively documented. The thesis of Graney's work is that Riccioli is being not just reasonable in his sort of assessment of these things, but he actually arrives at the most scientifically supportable conclusion regarding whether or not the Earth moves and the Sun does not. He points out that while Riccioli considers some 126 arguments, not all of these arguments have the same weight in the consideration of the matter. Rather, many of the arguments or points of contention are included not because they really have any merit, but only because they're part of the ongoing debate and thus Riccioli says they need to be considered and addressed before being discarded. In the long run, only a few arguments seem to hold sway with Riccioli, and these, by and large, favor a stationary Earth in Riccioli's estimation. As I have thought about the arguments of Lauker, Ingoli, and Riccioli, what I've been struck by is this reoccurring thought that I've had. And the, the thought goes something like, wait, you can't just say that. Why can't something be exactly the way you say that it isn't? And, you know, I want to be very clear here before I go on. While I may disagree with some of uh, Graney's conclusions about Riccioli's work being completely based in scientific consideration, I don't want to cast aspersions on Graney's book against all authority. It really is an important scholarly contribution to the dialogue about this part of the narrative in the debate between which model of the solar system is correct, especially in that it translates into English documents that just haven't been previously available. It just turns out that I just don't happen to agree with some of Graney's conclusions on this. What I kind of take issue with is the implication that Riccioli and others were primarily basing their evaluations of the models on only scientific evidence. I think that's just a bridge too far. While I do believe that's what Riccioli may have thought so that's what he was doing, his underlying bias plays a much larger role in his thinking than I think Graney credits. Let me see if I can give you an example of this. As I've mentioned, one of the main arguments each man takes traces back to the work of Tycho Brahe and his attempt to measure the sizes of the disks of the stars. Now. As we know, but they didn't, 
This observation that the stars are actually disks and not points is fundamentally flawed due to a phenomenon found in all things that are waves, something that we call diffraction. When light passes through a small opening, such as the pupil of an eye, the light doesn't travel in straight lines, but rather spreads out through what we call the aperture, even if the source of the light was a point very far away. To get a sense of this, you can actually sort of do an experiment where you light a candle and then stand as far away from it as you can. If you squint your eyes, you'll see that the perceived size of the light producing flame will change as you narrow the size of the opening through which the light passes to your retina. It turns out that this is a really hard problem to get around, though it was understood to actually occur at the time due to the development of the telescope, and that that was sort of an explanation was developed for it that was different than what we have now and physically incorrect. Nevertheless, even with the small telescopes of the time, the stars seemed to look like disks when one looked at them very carefully, and when the angular sizes of these disks were measured, numbers could be arrived at. Now this wouldn't seem to be too big of an issue until one combined that observation that the size of the stars could be measured with the reality that if you tried to actually measure something called stellar parallax, you failed to do that. Now to remind you, and we've talked about this in some previous episodes, parallax is the shift in an object's perceived position when observed from different locations. The example we've used several times is the shifting of your finger in front of your eyes when viewed first from your left eye and then your right eye by closing first one and then the other. The further the object away from the points of observation, the smaller the shift is going to be. The bigger the difference in observing positions, something we're usually referred to as the baseline, then the bigger the shift you'll get. For stellar parallax, if the heliocentric models were correct, the two positions from which the star would be observed would be on opposite sides of the Earth's orbit, which is a pretty big baseline. The fact that there was no observation of stellar parallax meant the stars had to be very, very far away in the heliocentric model, much further than the orbit of Saturn. The other fact, or at least seeming fact, that any star would be observed as a disk meant that not only were the stars very far away, but they had to be enormously large. And many of them, in fact, when the calculation was done, had to be at least as large as the entire orbit of the Earth. Some may be even as big as the entire orbit of Saturn. So, we have this chain of reasoning that begins with Galileo and is repeated with each successive rider as evidence against the heliocentric system. And let's take a moment to evaluate this. Inherent in each man's argument is the idea that such a thing would be absurd. And this is where, you know, every time I read about this, I kind of go a little nuts. And it's because the way I look at this is, why is this absurd? Why can't there be huge space between the stars? Or between the planets? Or between the stars and the planets? And then why can't the stars themselves just be huge? Maybe there are a lot of other stars that aren't very big like our sun, but that are too far away and thus too hard to see. Why can't any or all of these things be the case? And that's the thing I keep asking myself when I, you know, read about these guys' arguments and I say, you know, why is it that it has to be the way you describe it to be? And so for me, this is where the idea of bias in these authors' works becomes very clear. This is where one really begins to see that bias as the water these guys are swimming in. And it becomes even more apparent when one looks at the kinds of arguments being made from the other side of the question or the other side of the argument. One of the things that's really interesting that you see in pro-heliocentric model arguments during this time and following this time is that they often, rather ironically, take on specifically religious aspects. You'll read arguments where the author of a book or article will argue that the vast vault of the heavens or the collection of truly staggering celestial globes of just incredible size is a testament to the power and glory of God. Just as the anti-Copernicans had done, these authors mustered a variety of biblical passages to say that the celestial realms are a demonstration of the glory of God, and so the bigger and more spectacular they are, the more they proclaim his eternal glory.
What I think a number of modern historians do is they, they take this and they make the mistake of thinking that these religiously based pro-Copernican arguments are an attempt to use the Bible to support that position rather than mean what I think they are, which is a rhetorical attempt to combat a clear and pervasive bias that existed within the conversation of those who adhered to the Tychonic model or some variant of it. You see, from the time of Tycho onwards, one of the biggest arguments against the Copernican system was that all that weight, empty space was a waste. And why would God create such a waste? Why would God create all this empty space that seemed to have no purpose? It's a question that Tycho himself asked, and one that would be repeated over and over by individuals following him. In addition to this, there was this obvious belief, and it's a bias really, that God would not create greater lights in the heavens than that of the sun. Now, to be fair, Riccioli does at least credit to the Copernicans that such an argument is possible, but in his writings it's pretty clear that he thinks that these arguments are really extremely convoluted in nature and thus very highly unlikely to be true. Yet such an assessment seems to suggest rather clearly, at least in my mind, that Riccioli is working from the same type of bias that most of his Jesuit colleagues do, one that's pervasive. Humanity is privileged in some way. The earth can't just be another planet. The sun can't just be a small object lost in an immeasurably vast sea of emptiness. What it's telling is that not a single person, you know, at least outside of Giordano Bruno and later Christian Huygens, suggests that there might be things that we don't see even after Galileo and other people's telescopic observations showing, you know, things like an immeasurably larger number of stars than had once been thought, or, you know, new moons around planets or rings of Saturn or all those sorts of things that nobody thought had been there, and nobody could figure out why would God put them there if people couldn't see them. So, to me, all of this suggests that there was a pervasive bias in the science being done. Why Riccioli had other scientific arguments against the moving earth, good physical arguments. It really does seem, at least again to me, that he's willing to weigh them more heavily because he has an outcome that he wants to see work. Many of the arguments Riccioli cites in favor of a stationary earth were actually based in an Aristotelian physics that had been shown to have failed to account for the motion, specifically terrestrial motion, as far back as the 14th century in the work of Burden and Arisme. And moreover, in his 1651 work, he completely neglects Kepler's elliptical system of orbits, even though it has been making far superior predictions of, ge of planetary motions for over a generation. In other words, I think what's going on here is, you know, Riccioli, in considering his arguments, is sort of, you know, putting his finger on the scale a little bit. Now, you may want to say that, okay, so this guy works from his biases. Don't we all do that? And, of course, we all do. But I don't think it was inevitable that he had to work from those biases or just from any set of biases. There were other good thinkers who looked at the same evidence and came to very different conclusions. They thought about the same science that Riccioli did, and they came down on the side of Copernicus. While some of them will make religious arguments to support their adherence to a heliocentric model, as I mentioned earlier, again, this was most likely an attempt to counter the prevailing bias that God had to do things in a very specific set of ways for reasons that reinforce the idea of the centrality of humanity in all creation. Before we go any further, I really probably ought to admit that all of this is pretty easy for me to say looking back some 350 years after the events took place and the arguments were made. But I also think there's more to it than this. I think it's it's more than just, you know, I'm looking back from the from the perspective of history saying, well, gee, why couldn't they figure this out? We today live in a different time where we recognize that presence of bias even if we can't always identify the ones we're specifically affected by. 
in physics one of the things that you do on the theory side is that you try to develop descriptions of systems and one of the guiding principles of that development process is that the description should be as simple and elegant as possible of course that's sort of a bias right to do this you usually have to start by making any number of assumptions in order to simplify the model enough to make it both easier to work with and quick to determine whether it produces predictions about the behavior of the system that the experimentalists have reported observing. Once you do that, you have a hypothesis with an accompanying model, usually, that approximates reality in some way. Sometimes that approximation is pretty good, and it's, sometimes it's pretty comprehensive, and then sometimes it only gets the broad behaviors while not accounting for the details very well. So, how do you go about dealing with making a better hypothesis, either through starting over or refining something? Well, one way to do that is to examine the assumptions you made early in the process and determine if any of them can be changed or they need to be removed or something like that. As an example, in the case of our solar system models, Aristotle's picture of nested Eudoxian spheres was based on all kinds of assumptions like the Earth having to be at the middle of everything and everything moving in spheres and that sort of thing. And it seemed to get a few of the things right, but by and large, it failed to account well for the motions of the planets and the heavens. Its greatest strength was that it was integrated with the description of the motion found in Aristotle's physics. Over time, through the work of men like Apollonius, Hipparchus, and ultimately Ptolemy, some of Aristotle's assumptions were changed or rejected entirely, and a newer model did a better job of predicting where things would be in the skies. With the work of Copernicus, different assumptions were changed while some others were reestablished, and a new model arose, one of course that was heliocentric. Both models, however, again only approximated what was really seen. In time, Tycho would make a different set of assumptions, as would Kepler, and thus each of them would produce new models of their own. What I find really fascinating was that even though Kepler's model was far superior to matching the data being collected by the time of Riccioli, there were still only a few who'd agree to letting go of the assumptions of the orbits of the planets having to be circular. It is in this selection of assumptions to accept or question that I think we best see the biases of the people working in their fields. When I read, you know, the, the writing of someone who's making the argument that the Copernicus system couldn't have been correct back during that time because there'd be too much space, you know, that was empty or that the stars would too big, be too big, I always find myself asking, you know, why couldn't they have asked themselves some questions? Things like, why couldn't they have asked, why couldn't this be the case? Or, you know, I ask, why don't they see their own biases and accepted assumptions? Especially when their models didn't produce the observed motions of the planets in the heavens. The Tychonic model, at least until it's modified to include elliptical orbits by Riccioli late in his life, was ten times less accurate in predicting the positions of the planets than Kepler's model was something well understood by men like Gassendi and any number of lesser-known English astronomers of this period who used Kepler's models to predict events like the transits of Mercury and Venus across the face of the Sun. You know, I mean, the, the question I have is, why couldn't everybody see what those guys saw in that, you know, something like Kepler's elliptical heliocentric model did the best job of making predictions of what was seen in the heavens? You know, as we discussed in our episodes on the scientific revolution, it should be understood that, that during the 1600s, the idea of the authority of facts over reason or received tradition was only beginning to become established. And I think that's an important thing to understand when considering this stuff. Those who accepted this shift went end up, would end up having a leg up, but there was another thread that would be of great importance, and it had to do with just this process of understanding and dealing with bias. The ideas of eliminating bias can be traced back to the work of the medieval Islamic Hakim, up through the work of men like Roger Bacon. But in the most modern sense, they're most influentially discussed by Francis Bacon, and they would profoundly affect generations of thinkers that followed him. In Bacon's work, he identified four idols or sources of bias that must be accounted for and rejected before a philosopher, 
natural or otherwise, would move forward to discover the truth of something. And so I want to take just a moment to look at these things because I think they're really important in informing critical thinking and scientific thinking in general. The first of these he calls idols of the tribe. These are false concepts due to human nature. In other words, seeing things in relation to us as opposed to how they really are. In other words, Bacon rejects the idea that man is the measure of all things. In our context, Bacon would say that to understand the true nature of the solar system, we should take humanity out of the discussion. The solar system, he would think, would exist independent as a system of how that may or may not relate to humanity. The idea that human beings have to be central to the cosmos in some reason or another, he would identify as one of these idols of the tribe that would have to be rejected. The second one, which isn't as germane to what we're talking about, but I want to include it for completeness, he calls the idols of the cave. And these are false concepts that the individual holds based on previous learning or character. And it's he calls it the idols of the cave because it sort of refers back to that, you know, that platonic idea of, you know, people living in a cave and looking at shadows on a wall projected by something from outside the mouth of the cave. His third idea, or his third uh, source of bias, is what he called the idol of the marketplace. Okay, these are false concepts that are derived from human communication. This is the idea that language may bias thought. When we say that the sun rises, we're in this very choice of the description of the physical system, reinforcing the view that the earth is stationary and the sun moves. That's just right there when we say, oh yeah, the sun rose this morning, implicit in that is the fact that it's the sun doing the moving. The more correct and less model-specific description might be something like, gee, the sun appears at successively higher altitudes above the eastern horizon as time goes on. While not perfect, of course, this sort of description de-emphasizes the, the idea that the sun's the thing actually moving. Bacon's fourth and final bias source, or idol, is what he calls the idol of the theater. These are false concepts that arise due to received philosophical systems. In our example, Bacon would say that philosophers needed to stop thinking that Aristotle had any real authority in the discussion aside from something that he might have said that was based on actual empirical, observationally derived evidence and knowledge. The philosophical system received from him had no weight aside from that. Like his contemporary Galileo, Bacon found himself increasingly frustrated by the blind adherence to an obviously tottering set of philosophical descriptions. So Bacon said that these idols must be what he called cleansed or corrected through the use of experiments. And the goal in his doing this is sort of for the experimenter to become an absolutely objective observer and that those observations would be the sole bi basis for conclusions to be reached. Now, in our present postmodern times, this all seems a little bit naive, but you know, it should be said that this is still a goal worth striving for, even as we may, you know, recognize that it's a little bit unobtainable. So, you know, looking back on our man Riccioli, we should probably be very fair here and say more than anyone else, he's trying to base his work on observations, especially in the realm of physics. But I also think that it's fair to say that he's more than willing to weight the evidence for a stationary work more heavily than he is the evidence for a moving Earth, something that I think was, is the result of his bias towards certain types of assumptions. As I wrap this episode up, I want to draw some parallels here with more modern scientific debates and controversies, notably things like evolution and climate change. One of the things that really jumps out at you when you study the Galileo affair, affair and the actions of the Catholic Church and specifically Cardinal Bellarmine is how fundamentally the arguments used in that whole thing, that whole debate, are paralleled in the discussion of whether the diversity of species on the planet here is due to the action of evolutionary forces. Just as religious texts were first interpreted in an extremely literalistic way, and then those who disagreed with them were to an extent 
forbidden to teach or discuss those explanations that were counter to the ideas of the 1600s, so too was the case in the 19th and 20th centuries, where similar arguments were made from the newly powerful fundamentalist movement that arose after the Second Great Awakening in the United States. Those who were quick to jump to religious arguments to challenge the validity of evolution as a natural description of the mechanisms that give rise to all of the different flora and fauna we observed would do well, I think, to study the Galileo affair to learn from the pitfalls of using arguments from authority in realms where empirical evidence trumps whatever you may want to be the truth. It should also be a lesson for those engaged in the sciences on how important it is to treat those with whom you disagree with dignity and respect, acknowledging their legitimate questions and contributions. That's something Galileo didn't do, and it really cost him as his life went on. In the subject of climate change and the effect of human activity on accelerating it, one has to wonder what the role of bias is in so many of the public square conversations on this topic. I've often wondered that if we Americans didn't derive such a, an attachment to our cars, and that's an attachment, by the way, that's often necessary, and, of course, to the carbon-based fuel systems that power so many of them, would we be having the same conversation about this issue of climate change? One of the questions I, I often find myself asking is, if we took many of those who were so vehemently outspoken in their denial of the nearly overwhelming scientific evidence for there being a causal connection between climate change and human activity. And we placed all of their worldly wealth and all of the things that they value, their, their families, their kids, all of that, on a low-lying island in the Pacific, would they start seeing things in a very, very different way? I think, you know, the answer might be found in the fact that there are a lot of former skeptics of climate change in South Florida, where sea level rises have begun having a demonstrable impact on the very valuable and vulnerable seafront properties found there. I think, you know, the, the way I come down on this, and you may not agree with me on this, but I think you can spout all of the economic and political theory about the power of the market or the necessity of self-determination, but like the honey badger in nature, nature in the form of things like saltwater inundation or desertification, just doesn't care. Nature has a way of wiping away self-serving human ideologies and theologies, and no amount of savvy think tank marketing designed to confuse the issue will change any of that. As we wrap up, I hope you'll forgive the shorter episode this week. We started classes at Gordon State, and for me, that's always something that requires a huge investment of my time and energy, and it takes away from the time I have to, uh, to sit down and read and research and write. Combine that with some travel-related obligations I had this week, and it's been a real chore just to get something out. Nevertheless, I wanted to get you an episode to think about and chew over, and I think this one kind of does the trick. I'm guessing that for some of you, maybe many of you, I brought up one or more issues that you may disagree with or want to think about a good deal before accepting or rejecting them. I believe that's a good thing from time to time. You know, if you'd like to offer up some thoughts on what I've been discussing here, I would encourage you to do so over on our Facebook page. I think it'd be a great to have a conversation about some of the things that I bring up in this episode happen over there. I also hope that just because we may not see everything in the same way, you want to decide to disembark from the Odyssey at this point. I welcome a diversity of informed opinion aboard the ship, and if you think I've not considered something fairly or completely, I hope you'll let me know, that you'll provide me some resources from my own research, and then give me an opportunity to make a course correction if I think one's needed. Next week, we'll take a look at the development of a new physics by the reclusive and brilliant Lucasian Chair of Mathematics at Cambridge University. Until then, full sails on your journey.